Fawn Johnson is a correspondent for the National, for National Journal. She's covering a range of issues, including immigration, education, and infrastructure. Uh, Fawn is a Washington veteran, previously reporting for uh, publications like Dow Jones and the Wall Street Journal, where she covered financial regulation and telecommunications. Issues easier, I guess, than, than infrastructure. Uh, she's writing a lot on these issues that we're discussing today, and we really couldn't have, I think, a better person uh, to facilitate this discussion. So with that, please join me uh, in welcoming this panel. State by state uh, institutions are, are fascinating in how they deal with a really um, unpredictable and difficult federal uh, federal system. So, but I think I would like to open with Margaret um, because of Hurricane Sandy, uh, which I think had one of the bizarre effects of, of causing people to pay attention to the kinds of infrastructure that they might ordinarily ignore. So can you talk a little bit about your, um, your, new, your works task force, which was, I believe, put in place almost what, a year or so before Sandy, yep. and, and how Sandy has impacted your ability to explain to constituents what infrastructure is, what parts of it they should pay attention to, and how you can kind of shift the conversation towards something perhaps more productive than complaining about traffic or potholes. Right, <laughs> right, right. Thank you. Um, so S Sandy, I think most of you probably watched the news, saw that it leveled New York's economy like that. Um, things, everything shut down. Um, power systems were out. It was quite an extraordinary um, event for all of us. It was obviously a tragedy, but it was also a catalyst. And when um, something happens sort of outside of everybody's control, it becomes, oh, we better wake up and we better start looking at this. Um, you mentioned that um, I'm the executive director of the New York Works Task Force, which Governor Cuomo and the legislature put in place a year ago. Um, and we had begun to build on the work that Cuomo had started with the Regional Economic Development Councils to start to really just look at um, what Rob was talking about, which is that this is a systems problem and this is a multi-sector problem. So while transportation will always, I think, get the lion's share of the capital dollars, the way the economy works, the, whether it's broadband or power or w clean water, clean air, is all part of how we function in the private, um, private economy. So what Sandy did is it just it leveled the system, the economy stopped, and people started to get that our infrastructure systems in this country are what underpin the entire economy, and that that's why we're not a third world country. That's, that's why the, the modern economy is actually working. So what we started to do as a systems problem is reorganize. I mean, we're an old Northeast state with old infrastructure and also, frankly, you know, older systems of government. Um, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey was set up by a compact in 1921. So we're actually grandfathered out of the FAA rules because we preceded the FAA rules. And you find that throughout the, the throughway authority is the same thing. We pre, we were, ahead of Eisenhower and the, and the US um, interstate system. So when you have that kind of apparatus of government, it's very important to try to get, to, to get the, the, the apparatus to work together. And what we did with New York Works is we said, what are the major um, pillars of the economy, transportation being one, power is another one, et cetera. And we pulled together 47 agencies and authorities that are the apparatus of government that deal with each of these systems. So if you look at just transportation in the state of New York, we have 15 separate agencies and authorities that handle various aspects of it. So that's a lot of people, you know, that's a lot of, that's a lot. On the other hand, when you add it all up, we looked at a 10-year capital plan, which we pulled together using 
consistent criteria, it totals 174 billion over the next 10 years. That's not no money, that's real funding. So if we can start to target what we're spending that money on, what we're investing in, and look, keep going back to the real economy, look at what's gonna happen in the future, and even just shift 10% of that or 20% of that dollars, those are, those are very significant dollars. And what Sandy enabled us to do is really start to build on the Regional Economic Development Councils and start to use those 10 regions of the state um, and focus the so Long Island region, obviously completely devastated, um, lots of systems down, and you've seen a lot of action coming out of that in terms of how do we organize ourselves? How do we go from you know me or they, you know it's always about they, to we? You know how are we going to pull ourselves together, and how are we going to set this up? I mean, one of the things in terms of a counterparty risk that folks talk about is that. When you're, the, when you're the government, you're responsible. And I think one of the things that Governor Cuomo, Christie, et cetera, saw is that um, you know, it's up to the government to frame it and to set the table, as it were, and then to invite in you know, whether, whichever private sector, whichever um, process you want to use. But the government needs to um, really set the table and frame the discussion. And that's what Sandy really enabled us to do. So that um, as, we're, as we're proceeding now, I'll just, you know, a quick little story. Um, the hurricane happened at the beginning of November. You know, we kind of dug ourselves out probably by January. I think the state of the state speech was um, in, the, in the early January, really setting, looking at climate change and saying, we're gonna, you know, mother, mother nature owns this, we will offer to buy you out, as opposed to saying, you know, well, we're here, we want it. Um, so that it's a very practical response to what happened um, we got to Jones Beach, which is one of the famous, you know, public state-owned beaches, and really because of New York Works um, sorting people by region, sorting people by sector, um, state DOT, state Department of Environmental um, Conservation, and state parks came together, had a group of people, and were able to get the beaches completely rebuilt and reopened in time for Memorial Day. And the folks that were part of that effort said, this is how government should work. This is fantastic. You know, it's very practical. It was very results oriented. It was a can do kind of operation. And um, up until these efforts, I think a lot of, I mean, I'm amazed. I've been back in government now for a little over a year. The number of people that I have introduced to other people continues to astound, astound me, really. I mean, I, I think we're, we're really, we, we are we and we are all in this together. And I think that's part of what the catalyst of Sandy, as tragic as it was, um, helped people start to experience and kind of get out of their own, their own world. Right. I, I actually, one of the, I was looking up the New York Task Force and in the press release when it first was announced, um, one of the, one of, this is my favorite sentence of this, all major state agencies and authorities will be required to participate <laughs> on an implementation council and coordinate capital planning. So this is not voluntary, you have to <laughs> mandate it. Um, which makes me want to turn to Michael uh, because y your high performance transportation enterprise, which is a good, good name, um, also has, I think on your website or something, it says this shall operate as a government owned business <coughs> within the department and shall be a division of the department. So a government owned business Sometimes that might sound like an oxymoron. Uh, so exactly what is the high performance transportation enterprise? And after 40 years of being a lawyer in private practice, why have you now become a state employee running it? It's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> Shorten it for us. <laughs> we'll try to make it short. Um, the, the whole notion of a government, governmentally owned business is a uh, on the legal side is a function of uh, making an, an enterprise which is exempt from a particularly onerous constitutional restriction against uh, incurring long-term financial obligations without an election, uh, which of course you can't do without um, if you want to sort of uh, push the envelope in pursuing public-private partnerships, long-term concession agreements, whatever. So uh, it's partly a legal uh, requirement. It is partly also an expression of, an, uh, of a new vision 
of, uh, of uh, a legislative mandate that was uh, introduced by uh, uh, a Democratic governor um, who um, felt a, a need to pump some new energy into the state transportation system. Uh, and uh, with whom I worked closely in, in trying to pull together some new ideas into some legislation. Uh, that particular concept uh, and enterprise, which uh, has been lodged within the Department of Transportation, it's been in existence now for five years, I think. I always thought it was a little ironic that it was uh, generated by a, a Democrat because I think the conventional wisdom is that public-private partnerships are a creature of the Republican philosophy, you know, turning over governmental services to private enterprise, but um, it has also now survived and been given new momentum by a second uh, Democratic governor. Um, I joined the enterprise I think under some compulsion from um, from the governor who, after having helped him craft this legislation, came back and said, you know, this isn't gonna work unless you come in and help get it started. And, uh, you know, why, I- Why, why, what particular skills were needed, do it's, you think? It's a good question because we were talking about it this morning. I mean, there are, I think, uh, one of the problems in generating more of this activity is it does take a particular skill set. It takes um, uh, somebody, as Tony maybe will come back on later, it, it takes somebody who knows how to make deals. Um, and that's uh, not with, a government bureaucrat skill necessarily? Uh, uh, typically, <laughs> I think. But it also takes somebody who understands that on this side of the table, you're, you're dealing with a government and you're dealing with a political process, you're de dealing with a democratic process, you're dealing with goals that aren't necessarily always financial. Um, and um, so it's a unique set of, of competencies that are required on this, set of the, the, on this side of the table, which is part of the problem in getting this I think established throughout right. the states. Well, and, and you mentioned something interesting. You, your office spans two Democratic governors. Right. Uh, Tony's office spans both a Democrat and a Republican governor, who, on many other, in, <laughs> on many other topics, probably would not agree. Uh, but I mean, we, we talked about this. I, full disclosure, I wrote a story that featured Tony and his office as public-private partnerships. But tell us, tell us about the the transition from one administration to another in terms of how, you know, how that worked and, and um, ha the challenge of trying to continue a pipeline of deals as you've got administrations that are shifting with um, other political tides. Okay, fine. Uh, I mean, to, uh, to, to follow a little bit on, on Mike's comment, um, our office has set, been set up as a separate state agency that deals with all other sister agencies. We have, and it doesn't matter who the governor is, probably one of the fanciest uh, mission statements you could get. <laughs> it's close the deals and grow the business. So our function with regard to any governor is production. And yes, we have, a, we have an election coming up in November, um, but we've also just put about $6 billion worth of projects on the street with more to come and we expect to complete them. Um, I don't think, again, Fawn, in, in, in ending this, that the, 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 the party of the governor is that important because what happens is every state in the union suffers with the same problems. They have financial problems. They have, they, there is no more federal funding that's going to come. There is major issues, I believe, in most states to raise taxes. You have an educational problem with the people in the states that times have changed and there's no longer free money, as, as, as Bob said, and there's no longer these projects don't happen to be free. So how we deal with it is very simple. We do not look at them as public-private partnerships. That is, I think, very well, very aptly misnamed. They are public-private political publicity partnerships <laughs> <laughs> across the board. 
So what we try to do is, and a couple of people have mentioned it this morning, we're lucky and we have a state law in place since 1995. We have strong support in the legislature. We have a strong Secretary of Transportation. We have a strong governor. And they believe, and they believe totally, that infrastructure is the key component of Virginia's growth. So with that in mind, our job then is to use limited state funds to develop a pipeline that's meaningful of projects, which we have, and it's on our website, and a couple projects just went out. But it's very important in us that this, and we, we asked Mike, you asked Mike about a business in Colorado. Our, our job is to function as a business. We must develop the projects completely, do all the work up front with regard to environmental, all those components of it. So when we put a project on the street, the private sector knows there's a reasonable chance to get it done. So Fawn, to answer your question, if we have a Democratic governor come November or a Republican governor come November, those charges and mandates won't change. Right, and, and that, I think that's, that's one of the challenges, I mean, among many, trying to, to merge a, a government entities and, and private sector entities. They, they just, in, in some ways, they don't even speak the same language. Mm -hmm. um, so I, Larry, I saved you for last because your exchange is, to my mind at least, probably the most complicated. Uh, not only does it span several states, it spans a country, um, and it, I, I, just looking at your bylaw, I mean, it's several pages long, um, but here, here's, here's one of the goals. It, this is a, they're, they're aiming high here. They're going to target infrastructure investment opportunities that include, but are not limited to, energy transmission efficiency, water storage capacity, and municipal water systems, wastewater management. So just tell us about this exchange. It, it seems um, probably the biggest and most ambitious of, of what I've heard in the United States. How, um, how it came to be, and, and we could talk a little bit more about the challenges you face sure. statewide, um, I mean, intrastate. So it's, um, it's just getting started, and it involves California, Oregon, Washington State, and British Columbia, where I come from. And currently the objective is to, is to create a standardized market and to present it to the private sector so that there can be standardization across a bigger market than just one state. And the reason that British Columbia is involved is because uh, we've, we've been doing public-private partnerships since 2002. So British Columbia has about 4 million people, has a capital spend of 6 to $10 billion a year, depending on how you define it. And we've done, I'm working on 40 public-private partnerships for a capital value of some 13 or $14 billion. So we've been working on it for some time, and we've learned some things about how to create a viable and attractive P3 market. And um, I think the four states, uh, three states in British Columbia, have similar ingredients. One is you have to have political support um, that uh, motivates the bureaucracy and, and also uh, provides comfort to the private sector to come and bid in your market. You need a policy environment, and British Columbia has that. It's pretty straightforward. It's the capital standard, if it's a capital project more than $50 million, you have to look at a public-private partnership when you do your business case. It's the same all across Canada, and the federal government has the same policy, and we would hope to introduce that kind of a framework uh, um, elsewhere in, 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 the West, in the exchange. And finally, you have to have an institution, and so British Columbia has an institution, Partnerships BC, which uh, works across all sectors, um, transportation, healthcare, uh, energy dams, correctional facilities, educational institutions, social housing, water, wastewater, the works. And you learn in one sector and you would apply it in another, and so we'd be recommending the same kind of frameworks uh, for the West Coast Exchange. So it's, it's starting, there's a memorandum of understanding uh, among the four organizations, and uh, people are working hard to see where it goes. They've got an executive director and um, are moving forward. And well, and tell us a little bit about how the, since since it sounds like British Columbia was farther along in terms of un, in terms of its development of this kind of project, how you brought the other states along. Did you did you have any any problems with that? Well, any lessons you want to share? We're, we're in a we're in a different country, so we <laughs> we, we don't uh, we don't intervene. But we were in British Columbia invited, just based on our experience, right. to participate in developing some best practices and some, we've got template documents and we've 
got lessons learned and we've got some things that we can contribute. And so we are volunteering to do that, but no, we were invited. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and I think, I mean, Tony, you had mentioned also, that, and probably all of you function as opinion leaders in the transportation community around states that are, that are in the infant stages of trying to attract any kind of, of private investment. Um, I, I know that we talked about this. Um, so, Margaret, you had suggested um, a, a, a question to me earlier, but I actually would like to open it up to the entire panel because I think this is really gets to the heart of the, the publicity aspect of infrastructure development that Tony was talking about. Um, so your, your statement is that financing infrastructure will always be taxes, tolls, fares, or fees, whether it's a public-private partnership or any other kind of um, structure. So I'd like you to explain that, but I also would like the other panelists to talk about how, how why it is that it's important to remind the people in your state that, that this isn't free? Because I think that that's part of the issue in terms of getting from, from a can-do, uh, or getting right, to a can-do right. place, because a lot of people are like, we should be doing this already, and I shouldn't <laughs> be stuck in traffic. So tell, explain this a little bit more. Um, so, I, and I think going back to the, you know, is the, this isn't really a Republican or Democratic idea particularly. It's a practical American idea, in my view. And I don't think that Europe invented this or Canada, to be frank. I think America invented this. And we started in, I think it was 1789, Congress passed the first piece of legislation that created, I think it was a toll road. You know, the Brooklyn Bridge was built as a concession agreement. That was it, it's not that complicated. You know, that's how the subways got done in the city of New York. So this isn't anything new, it's just we haven't done it since I believe it really stopped around 1933. Why? Because the private financial markets stopped functioning. That's it. The way that this works is that the public um, municipal debt market is alive and well and functioning perfectly well. And we'll continue to do that as long as there are issuers you know, my state has really four major issuers. Um, the city of New York issues, lots of people issue general obligation debt. All this debt, and, and, and I do have to correct my friend Rob about one of his slides about sources of funds. The source of the funds is not municipal bonds. That's simply a financing vehicle. The sources or whatever the cash flow stream are that underpin the debt that you take on. And really what you want to try to do is set it up so that your asset and the length of time that your asset's going to be in service um, is, is in tune with how you're financing it. And, and I think all of us as homeowners, all of us as taxpayers, we kind of get that. Um, the sources of the cash flow are government receipts, and government receipts are taxes, tolls, fares, and fees. And I'm quoting one of my task force members, um, who's um, Bob Yarrow, who's the president of the Regional Planning Association, a very long and storied um, you know, Regional Planning Association that's done a lot of work in the tri-state region over decades and decades. Um, so all that I'm saying is that when the private sector defined it, you know, back in the day, um, I think it was sold to many public officials as a pot of free money. And such a thing does not exist. And I think this, this cannot turn into a fee bonanza where the private sector comes in and says, you know, you know gimme, gimme, gimme. It has to be a, um, a counterparty, two counterparties, the government counterparty with you know, very deep skill set. The, the, the public sector operating environment is way more complicated than the private sector operating environment. And I spent enough time in the private sector to be able to say that it's much simpler to run a multinational corporation than it is to run a public um, enterprise in a democratic society. It just is. It's just by its nature. It's not a command and control environment. Now, I think what's actually really interesting is that um, the, the, the term of art in the internet world is a distributed network. So in a distributed network, everybody is smart, and it's the network that becomes smart. And what we saw in New York State after Sandy is the network went black, and you had to get it up and going, and you had to get everything going, and it's all connected. The apparatus of government that we've, that we're, where we are right now is we're still in this kind of silo mode, which you know you, you could say maybe General Motors looked like that before its bankruptcy, where you're, 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 you're flat. Where we're growing now is we're going from that very siloed thing to turning it so that it's a connected across all of the 
all the sectors of the economy. So from my point of view, when you look at how do you pay for it, it's always going to get paid for by the same way. It's just a matter of you take those streams of money, the streams of cash coming out of everybody in this room's pockets, and you say, well, how are we going to direct it? How do we use it efficiently? How do we not do sort of bridges to nowhere? Why? Because we are now in a global economy. We can't afford to do that anymore. Um, and how do we make sure that we're staying at the forefront of competing? You know, my own view is I'm going to bet on New York. I'm going to bet on the US any day of the week. You know, I, I think we have an open system. I think we're really smart. And I think we know how to be very pragmatic. But that means that you have to then look and say, OK, taxes, tolls, fares, and fees, what's the most cost effective, pra practical way to get this particular project done? Well, and Michael, can you talk a little bit about what you had to learn about the very complex way that the public sector works coming in from private practice when you took on your new role? And I think Tony probably has some stories as well. In fact, I know he sure. does. Sure. We, <laughs> we had, uh, I had a number of lessons uh, that I needed to learn. Um, um, and I had the benefit of having um, not only a, uh, a governor's office, but also a, a transportation director and a regional transportation director who got it, who were supportive who were willing to make changes within the department to support this particular uh, activity, uh, who reorganized uh, around it to provide uh, the, the support capability that those departments had always had to provide uh, engineering support and environmental support and uh, design support for the projects that we were financing. Um, but I needed to learn the lessons, uh, of, you know, that the engineers have been able to, to provide for me and, and that kind of thing. So it, there is a learning curve. There's a steep well, and did they, curve. I mean, did, did they need to, what, what did they need to learn from you? I mean, I think part of the issue here sometimes is, is literally being able to take somebody who is well versed in, in the ins and outs of how a bureaucracy works and try and explain it to, I mean, if you're, if you're thinking about it in your own boardroom and trying to make a deal, you need to be able to explain it to somebody who's in the private sector. So did, uh, were there ways that you could, things that you had to explain to them before you well, could even a, get the one conversation is, going? You know, you need to assume that public servants are um, genuinely interested in serving the public. I mean, they're there, right. and they want to do a good job, and they want to learn new things, and they want to do uh, uh, they want to do good things. So, if you come from that uh, understanding, I think you get a long ways. And if there is mutual respect between the, our, our, you know, I, I'm I'm a state employee at this point, so we're colleagues, and. If you approach things on that basis, it goes a long way. And I've got things that I can teach them, given my you know, long sort of history as a finance lawyer. And they've got things that they can teach right. me. And we've been able to hammer that out, and I think to the benefit of, of everybody. You should tell us about your right hand um, <laughs> man at the Office of Public Private. Uh, well, <laughs> basically, every one of our employees started um, internally at VDOT. So you would think, although we work with all state agencies, that you would have just an open-minded staff that thinks about how to do these businesses in a different way. That is absolutely not true. And how these things, how these P3s start, they're all very complicated. But I think there's an education process that must take place from both sides. You always have the, the public side talk about the private sector. It's not us and they, it's we. And I think the, 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 the private sector I think has done a good job, but they have to continue to work harder and harder and harder to understand what a state bureaucracy has to go through. The United States has difficult. There's 50 of them. By the same token, you cannot have a, a state operation say that's not how we do it. This is the way we've done it for years. Because those days are over. And, the, and as Margaret talks about, the pot of free money from, from back in the past, or my God, you're working with a concessionaire, it's a foreign country where 85% of the jobs are done by people in Virginia. That's an education process. 
The hardest education piece, though, I think for P3s, is you have to assume that your state will back you up. You have to assume that you have strong enough partners to get these deals done. The most difficult part of successful P3s is the outreach with the public and the legislature. I would contend that in your state, most of the legislatures do not have a full understanding of P3s. I think they do not. And if they don't, what percentage of the public do you think has an understanding of P3s? So as you drive these benefits forward, I think a strong outreach program that starts very much in the beginning, whether it's your, your local MPOs, the local senators, legislatures, Baptist ministers, I don't care who it is, you educate them on the benefits of why this project is important. Our office will never care of the quality of asphalt that goes on these roads. I can tell you that right now. But we're going to spend a myriad of time working with the public. So the public can't come up with a misconception on what the project is for and what the benefits are. They always start with safety. They talk with military egress. They talk with economic development. And they're the things that are important. Why are you going to have a concession that I may have to pay a toll for? because it might get you home an hour earlier and it won't cost you $1,000 a year, it'll cost you 18 cents a day. I think we have to translate this communication to, to me and to everybody in this room so they understand it at a grassroots level. If we talk about billion dollar projects and we talk about that type level, the public just goes away. We don't need it, it's another road project. But you know something, if we can save you a gallon of gas a day to get home to your family, that's a benefit or we can do this and save you 30 minutes of congestion time in Washington, D.C. That's a benefit, and we have to continue to sell those benefits. So what I've learned from it is you cannot assume that because you come out with this brilliant P3 project that the public understands why you're doing it. Well, you need to educate them. Let's talk for all of you a little bit about the, the most common uh, public public consumption or public understanding of a P3. I'm not even sure we should call them P3s. That's such a, <laughs> no. such a wonky term, but um, which are um, concession agreements on, on tolls. Um, the, you know, the big knock on concession agreements, as I understand it, is that they, they last a long time. Um, they last lifetimes. And that those are the kinds of deals that uh, if someone is newly elected to office, they might have a hard time swallowing. So how do you, how do you, um, I mean, th this is obviously one way, not the only way, but one way to finance needed infrastructure. How do you explain concession agreements? Where are they appropriate? And, um, and, and what, can you, what can you do to elevate the level of discussion on, say, you know, the comments that you'll see in the local newspaper about, the, the, which is where, that's about the level that I like to look at sometimes, just to see how the public is, is portraying this. How can you elevate that, um, and, and what are the essential elements of that? So i open that up to whoever wants well, to. What, yeah. what we have found after, after 12 years is that the um, public doesn't really care um, how the project is delivered. They just want the project. So when they yeah. see a new car, they like the car. They don't care what the factory was that produced the car. Um, the really important thing that we learned about P3s is that government has to spend money up front. Because of the 30, 40 year nature of the project, because they're so complicated, you have to do a business plan that includes a really comprehensive risk analysis. If you're thinking about transferring tolls, the concessionaire, if they take toll risk, they will have more equity in the project and they'll require a higher return. There is a cost to transferring tolls. So why are you doing that? Why are you transferring toll risk? Is it worth it? And every risk can be analyzed in the same way. Should this be transferred to the private sector or should you keep it? It's so critical, and the exercise of doing a business plan, it might cost you $2 million, but for a $300 million project, you know, you're going to get paid back that cost. But that, that exercise of risk assessment and whether you should mitigate a risk, or whether you should transfer it, and where are the interface benefits from combining design and build and finance and maintain, are those benefits there? Are your performance specifications correct to transfer risk and encourage innovation? Because P3s are all about cost-effective risk transfer and encouraging innovation and you know you have to do the work up front. I agree. I mean <laughs> basically I, I agree totally. I think I think there's 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 probably a couple of other things there and again that gets back to education. Most states do not have the money to do these massive transportation projects right now. 
Most states cannot afford to sit back and wait for that because other states are competing with them for economic development and those kind of things. So if you hesitate, you're going to lose. So P3s, across, I must tell you, are never going to be for every project. At most, they're probably going to be 10 to 15 percent of our projects, and I think that's a high number. Mm -hmm. But what happens, if you're going to do that P3 and you're going to ask the public to get involved, you must get the public involved. And the public has to understand why their money is being used this way and what it's going to deliver. <laughs> All the value for money studies and, and, all, and those type things that we're talking about must be done. But until you do them, you can't go on the street and say you have a P3 because you'll get annihilated. It's, it's really about building a business, and that's why I said in the beginning, a public-private partnership is not a public-private partnership. It's public-private political and publicity, and you must educate everybody. There are benefits here. You hear so many things that on, the, on a public-private partnership, well, the the concessionaire is going to realize a profit. I don't believe anybody on this panel or anybody in this room has ever written a contract that didn't have profit in it. The word is not to be profit. It's a reasonable rate of return, and that comes to his, my colleague's comments about what are the benefits of a project going forward. If we're going to do it, what does it mean? Right. Well, Margaret, I mean, you guys, New York has other ways of financing. Right, so I'd like to so, talk about, as an example, you know, as an, as an illustration of this is the Tappan Zee Bridge, which um, was a, is a New York Works project, New York Works um, Task Force project, very much run um, um, fr from the top, and the initial engineer's estimates for that project, and the discussion had been going on for, I think, 15 years about this bridge, because it's expensive. And Governor Cuomo said, we're going to rebuild this bridge and got legislation done to do a design build um, as opposed to a full-on P3 for exactly that reason. There's no reason to shift the toll revenue risk. Right. You know, we'll just hold on to that risk. And um, we also did, uh, through the design build procurement, um, a stipend to the finalists. You know, over a million dollars went to, to each of the finalists. Well, that, you know, this was a, this was a pretty big sort of uphill push but at the end of the day, we had an engineer's estimate started extremely high. There was a zillion different um, public discussions uh, through Westchester County, Rockland County, et cetera. Um, and ultimately, the, 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 the bridge cost came down by a billion dollars because the private sector bidders who do what they do very well, they're you know, entrepreneurial engineers bringing to the table how to do the construction. Um, process, we're able to take a billion dollars out. Now, we, we think it might come in lower than that, actually, but we'll go with that. We'll take it. And so from a, you know, just as a business model, if we're the business, that was well worth the, the, um, the time and the money that it took to bring in a different sort of design-build approach. And one of the big things that I see between the private sector when I was doing, you know, private sector building, private sector development, and the public sector is that we, we had an ownership mentality, meaning the, the profit and loss statement, the P&L, the cost, was completely baked into the engineering decisions and, and how you go about doing that. What happens in the private sector, public sector currently, is the municipal bond markets are one thing and the engineers are something completely different. And, and what a, a P3 allows you to do is come in and look at it, sort of knit that back together which again goes back to what Rob was saying. We have this kind of apparatus of government that is currently relatively siloed. The private sector has gone flat. You know, they turned it on its, on its head. I looked into one project, um, the 287 route was 10 years behind schedule, yabbity, 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 you know, it's all caught up. We got done eight months early. You know, we did beat the last schedule. But when I looked at it, the engineer in charge at state DOT was 13 levels below the commissioner of DOT. And when I was in the private sector, I was two down from the chairman. I mean, it's just not, you, you, there, there's, there's going to be very slow decision making in, in when you have that kind of structure. But again, in a democratic process, there's a reason why there's all those layers. There's a reason why there's a lot of people in the room. I mean, we could have a project meeting with this many people in the room, right? I'm sure for the Tappan Zee Bridge, there was many project meetings with this number of people trying to come to some kind of agreement. And that's what I mean about you can't say that the politics is over here and the engineering's over there. Right. And, and, you know, Tony, I think you're exactly right. You need to be 
out and about, and we need to decide how do we want to approach this? How do we want to skin this particular cat? Well, and maybe both Michael and Tony, you can talk a little bit about how your, your, your particular offices are structured within the state to allow you a little more flexibility. So, Michael, why don't you tell us how far down are you from the from the governor or from the transportation secretary? Or well, yeah. you know, there are organizational charts and there are also relationships. Well, right. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> the, um, you know, my particular enterprise is a unit within the Department of Transportation. So technically I answer to the director of transportation. I have uh, an independent board which I answer to, um, and then ultimately to the governor. Uh, so I, I have some independence because of that board uh, from the Department and of Transportation. And how important is that for you to be able to? Quite important. Right. It's quite important. Um, and, uh, you know, you always look for as much independence and flexibility as you can get, but you're working within a, you know, within a certain structure. Right. right. Well, I, I, think, I think you always have a bureaucratic structure. We report uh, directly to the Secretary of Transportation and then to the Governor. And that's important because we work very closely with all the sister agencies because our function really does have a target on the front and on the target on the back. As you can imagine, the Governor and the Legislature, once these projects done, the individual agencies may get a little upset sometimes because you're bringing a project to them that they haven't brought forward. But at the end of the day, by having a separate office, we work very closely with these agencies. We develop the project and the, and the procurement for them, but ultimately, at the, end of the, at the end of the day's day, they'll sign the contracts, but we still have to report back to the secretary and the governor and say, this project will be completed. Here are the options. Here's what we've studied. So the flexibility that we have enables us to be free of binding alliances it allows us to be in a spot to be a little bit of a nudge, quite frankly, with the agencies to push a project that they may not have thought. But lastly, at the end, it delivers completed projects to the citizens of Virginia, and that's our function. So we never go to work in the day feeling that this is going to be a quiet, calm day. It right. generally is never. <laughs> well, and, and I mean, this is, we've got even a more complicated situation with the, with the WCX. So tell us how it's working out for you. Well, uh, well to begin, partnership, uh, Partnerships BC is outside the government. We're, we're owned by the Minister of Finance, um, but we're independent, have a separate board like Colorado, and that enables us to work across all sectors and to focus on P3s and procurement. So we work for a government department, they pay us by the hour, and um, they tell us what the services are that they want to get from us, they evaluate our performance, and we work on business planning, on the procurement manager uh, in the project team, and then in some cases we'll do construction oversight uh, when we're, we're past financial closing. That kind of model, um, I think, is, uh, has a commercial jump to it, and uh, we're outside the rules of government, so we can hire and fire and retain uh, more flex with flexibility like the private sector. We can load up for projects, and then we can downsize when the projects are finished. Uh, we can bring people on as contractors for projects. We can Finish, when they're finished, we can let them, let them go back and do other things. And uh, whether the West Coast Exchange does the same thing, I think each state will have to make its own decision about what works for them. But I really believe in the importance of an independent organization that can work across sectors and focus on procurement. Like in government, procurement is not the most glamorous thing. Most people would rather do the health care or do the highway or do something else other than the procurement. We do the procurement and we do the stuff that everybody else doesn't want to do and, and we specialize in it. Um, I think it's time for us to open up to questions. So we have a couple of mic runners. Um, so it looks like right up here, the first, if you could just identify yourself and, and keep your question a question so that we have time to get for everybody. That would be awesome. I'm Basil Scarless. I used to work uh, on economic policy at the U.S. Department of State. And I'd like to direct my question to Mr. Blaine. Uh, in I just wondered how did the, the transportation disaster, the collapse of the bridge between Seattle and Vancouver have an impact in BC? Did, the, did your commission get involved and make suggestions or encourage uh, uh, reconstruction? And secondly, I have a question relating to NAFTA. Did the North American Free Trade Association 
give you a context or was, were you able to operate completely outside of that context? Uh, I think the bridge slowed down shopping for a while because a lot of Canadians <laughs> go down. Uh, but uh, we haven't uh, we haven't had any involvement in the in in the project that you know the reconstruction project. But I mean that would be an example where if they wanted to do a procurement that it could use standardized documents through the West Coast Exchange it would be very appropriate you know in the future for that sort of relationship to take place. Now your question about NAFTA is really interesting because. Uh, the, the critics of public-private partnerships, the main critics in Canada, uh, are the public unions. And they made the case that, um, you know, due to NAFTA, if we had a contract with a foreign uh, concessionaire, that they could come in the middle of the night and steal our wastewater treatment plant and take it back uh, to some other country under the NAFTA rules. And so we went to the trouble of getting legal opinions, which uh, said very, very clearly that that doing a PPP procurement, you know, whether it be with Canadian suppliers or foreign suppliers, it was ir ir irrelevant to NAFTA. Other questions? I see one in the, how about in the back here, and then we'll go back there, and wow, lots of them. We'll get through as many as we can. Great, thank you. Um, I'm Sue Gander with the National Governors Association. Since this is a room of wonks, I'm gonna get down into the weeds. Um, one of the models that um, we've been hearing more about within the P3 realm is the use of availability payments. Um, you saw it in Long Beach at the courthouse there and, and the Miami project. Um, just like to get folks' thoughts on where they see that model going, pros and cons. Um, what's the prospect on that? Tony, you know about this one. Um, I think from our perspective in the Commonwealth of Virginia, Availability payments must be something that's added to our toolkit. Um, when you have a concession, a project, you, you, you by design, it's going to be told or there'll be user fees. Um, if you have an availability payment, that's not necessarily so. Um, it, it, it all depends, I think, on the, on the laws in your given jurisdiction. We are one step away from having them approved and coming out with three availability payment projects. And I think there's two key, key reasons for it. It is, it will enable us to get our facilities up to the standards that we think they should be quicker. It will also, on the P3 perspective, and I go back to the public-private political publicity partnerships, if we're successful with this, this opens up rural areas for projects that could be construed under availability payments which would eliminate in Virginia, if you look at the map, you're going to have Northern Virginia, you're going to have Tidewater and perhaps Richmond, but there is Lynchburg and there is Roanoke and there is Charlottesville, and this could enable us to do projects in that area. We're kind of excited about the possibility. We're going to pursue it. I think it's something that will continue to grow in the states depending on their legislation. It makes sense to me in a business perspective. Colorado, uh, New York, <laughs> talk. Good luck. Um, we've, we've done it with the Gothels Bridge, the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey did unavailability payment. Um, to me, design, build, finance, operate, maintain. In a lot of ways, it makes sense for the finance to be held on the, on the government side of the, le the ledger. You know, it depends on really go to, work to your strength. And Color Colorado agrees as well. We, we are starting to look at it quite seriously. M primarily both? because of the, uh, not primarily, it may be cheaper to do it that way, uh, and the availability, uh, excuse me, of uh, uh, risk capital seems to be uh, diminishing. Mm -hmm. Most of the projects in Canada are availability projects. Um, one reason being because a lot of them are in the healthcare sector, where there's of course no no revenue. But on the transportation side. Uh, we learned that it's very expensive to transfer toll risk and uh, the private sector can't really manage that risk any better than the public sector mm -hmm. and then there's public policy issues around tolls uh, and who can set them and how long they have to be hardwired in. So um, m most of the projects are availability. Good question. Um, so let's see, I saw a hand up here um, in the on the aisle here and then we'll move in I guess. <laughs> Hi, good morning. I'm Tiffany Wan. I'm, oh, let me see. I'm a GovLab fellow at Deloitte's public sector think tank. And I have a question for all four of you. Um, do you think there is a role for the federal government to play in facilitating this type of creative 
infrastructure investment? And if so, what do you think it should be? Thanks for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants it? <laughs> Tony's looking at yeah, me. me. So I'm <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I, think, I think the states need all the help they can get. I think if, if is, as long as the federal government can come up with policies that are not restrictive and enable the states to do more, I think there's a place for them. I think it all comes down to a simple fact. Uh, I think financing, in, increasing of the financial um, opportunities is probably the most important. But there probably is a place for the federal government but this business is in its infancy. I think we got to go a little bit and see where it comes. Michael? Well, uh, you know, an essential element of most of the successful um, P3 financings that I'm aware of has been either the, the TIFIA program, uh, which the federal, federal government has increased in size. Uh, it's, it's running into some, you know, some problems in terms of efficiency and moving quickly and flexibility, those kinds of things. So those have to be ironed out. I think there's a, n a new counterpart in the water area, uh, WIFIA or something mm -hmm. like that. Right. Right? Yep. Uh, so those kinds of, of financial assistance, I think, is, uh, are helpful. I also, I, I remember asking a similar question to us. Um, a long, long time staffer on the Transportation Committee in the House when I was writing a story about uh, tolling a couple of years ago. And, and one of the things that, that he told me was he felt like the federal government could act as an advisory capacity to a lot of the smaller, particularly on the municipal level, because I mean, the way he described it is that you've got these multi-global multi companies, you know, billions of dollars that are used to doing these deals all over the world, sitting in a conference room with someone's mayor. And that, that I mean, this is assuming, of course, that you have a government that, that, that is working working fairly well and you know sometimes that happens sometimes it doesn't but but that struck me as a, as a particularly good way to think about a federal role that this is where they can develop some expertise H how they distribute it is a whole other question but so let's see where are we how about up here in the front because i <laughs> hands been up for a hi hank webster with the american road and transportation builders association uh, I was wondering if I could get comments from any of you. Tony, I understand you might not be able to, but if you are looking at the Virginia court case and what your thoughts on the possible implications of an opinion in either way, uh, and certainly, Larry, in your capacity with the, the West Coast Infrastructure Exchange, uh, I know it won't affect Canada, but uh, if you could comment at all uh, on that. Sorry. I don't either. I mean, I don't. You, does everybody know what he's talking about? It's, it's the... Uh, it was a, a, a federal, or not, a, a state judge ruled state unconstitutional a tolled bridge or tunnel in between right. um, Portsmouth, and, Portsmouth, Portsmouth and, and Norfolk. Norfolk uh, for, because I can't remember what the exact legal ruling was, but it's, it's a setback in one of the deals that you guys have been doing. Well, it, yeah. not necessarily a setback. Hank, I can yeah. talk a little bit about it. Uh, this is called positive I, I didn't spin. Say it. Right. He, didn't, <laughs> he didn't say it was a set back. I mean, that he was knows my... us. <laughs> um, Hank, no, look, um, we have been, there have been tolls implemented in, in Tidewater since 1790, which is quite a while. <laughs> um, we, the, the, the state has followed every rule they can on the, on the Midtown Tunnel project. The Portsmouth judge that passed that rendering, everybody talks about there was eight points they won one. There will be decided in court in September, and we are going to aggressively pursue it because all laws have been followed. I mean, I hope that answers your question. We are not backing down. We're, we're in agreement. I'm just wondering if there's any, um, the, the different programs that you were running, for example, in Colorado, looking at it, and is the availability payment method becoming more you know, trendy or popular? Um, you know, are there other preparations underway anywhere? Yes. Yeah, there, there, are, there are either way, and you know, quite frankly, in doing the study, it seems like most every major P3 project in the United States has some type of court case attached to it. <laughs> so we're, we're preparing as you, as you would. I mean, I hope that answers your question. It does. Thank you. More questions up here in front, I guess? I, see you, I saw your hand first, so you win. My name is Caleb Orr. I'm an intern at the House of Representatives. 
Um, so not exactly a policy wonk with this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't worry. Give you about six months. If, if the Federal Reserve uh, goes through with its tapering of bond buying programs, or if any time in the future um, the buying of bonds significantly becomes less aggressive, how does that affect the interest rates within your infrastructure investments, and how does that change the way in which you pursue infrastructure projects in the future? You said you weren't a wonk <laughs> and asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry, uh, I, I can share with you the experience that we had in 2008 with the financial crisis when we were relying on cheap long-term money uh, to finance all our projects and all of a sudden that cheap long-term money became expensive long-term money and we learned to economize on the private finance that goes into a P3 versus the public finance and we learned to combine borrowed public money which is cheap with more expensive private capital and we learned to optimize and I think that if interest rates go up, you'll find the same effect, that, you, if, that those entities that can borrow in their own name will borrow and combine the capital with private capital, and that way you get more value for money on the P3. I suspect that will happen globally if interest rates go up. One more, I think, in the back here, or in the middle, I guess. The, the, the longest walk for our mic runner. <laughs> Yes, good morning. I'm John McGaugh, the Director of Capital Improvements for Mayor Gray's office. Uh, would anyone care to comment on uh, what a stupid idea it is for the Congress to consider uh, limiting uh, uh, income from tax-exempt municipal bonds? And should that go through, hopefully it won't, what would, how would we restructure how the deals that we're doing in a way that makes sense financially? Who wants it? <laughs> well, well, I guess it w this is what I would say. I think it, it's, a, it's a problem that we'll face when we get there, which is not to punt on it, but uh, the reason I went to business school, honestly, is that my mother was a widow, and her interest rate on, on our home was, at that point, the prime rate, I think, got to 18%, and I kept wondering, what the heck does Paul Volcker do for a living? I don't get this. And so off I went to business school to try to figure that out. I, I think when it comes down to it is it's, it's just another stream. We, we as a country are extraordinarily wealthy. We have 300 million shareholders, if you want to think about it that way. And we have to decide like where's, where's the money coming from and where's the money going? And I think there's really just two questions that, get, that government asks and answers. And the first question is who gets to decide? That's the first question. In fact, I had the radio on this morning and I heard all about the nuclear option, and it comes down to who gets to decide, right? The second question is who pays? And I think what happens is that it becomes a corollary to the answer to the first question, because I think different, you know, obviously I work for a Democratic um, governor. Governor Cuomo believes in the power of government, and he is a progressive. So we have, I would say, a fairly healthy regard for what government can do and what it can't do every single one of these policy decisions have downstream effects. And you just have to decide that what's the effect that you're looking for and how does that work. I think the sooner that the private sector gets that, when they come to see us and we're, we're looking at doing, structuring these things, I'm trying to make sure that the counterparty risks are, you know, that we have two equal parties sitting at the table. Municipal debt is just municipal debt. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have to get repaid, it does. So you have to look at the length of term, you have to look at the interest cost. You know, we've all, those of us that have been around long enough have seen up and down cycles in terms of interest rates. You adjust to whatever that reality is. That's Without right. a doubt, as interest rates go up, fewer projects will get done because we can't afford them. But we are a very wealthy country and it is up to us to decide how do we want to you know, proceed together on that. I don't know what's going to happen with the Senate rules. Clearly, whatever happens will have effects immediately. It will have effects in 10 years. It will have effects in 20 years. You know, it, but it takes the Senate so long to make these decisions. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think we're going to have to cut it off here, much as I'd like to continue this discussion because I know the governor has to catch a plane. So can we give a round of applause to all our very smart people on this panel? Good seeing you. Good seeing you too.